As you know, art research takes many forms from books to paintings, from performance to coding. And in recent years, our faculty lecture series has celebrated the incredibly diverse research of our, that our faculty produced in so many areas and so many levels of excellence. Now we're excited to re rewind, to look back at the work and to talk with these artists about how their work has evolved and about what new possibilities they've uncovered by continuing to investigate and to innovate. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Madam Dean. And thank you, Lee and um, Art Research for inviting me to come back to share the progress of my research. So yeah, I am Masalemu from um, a sculpture department. Uh, last time I presented on my research titled The Malayan Dugout Canoe is Text. Um, I argued that the Malayan dugout canoe is text simply because uh, on its surface are textures that can be read as text, text that speak to issues of um, endangered ecosystems in uh, extractivist capitalism um, and other, other economical, political, and social, social political issues. Um, we can go to the next the next slide. So the dugout canoe is basically made out of one tree trunk. And when it's used, when years passed, when it starts rotting, the fish has repaired it with um, different materials to patch and seal the canoe. So you find metal, plastic, um, tar, felt accumulating on the surface of the canoe uh, serving as a you know repair and sealing the canoe but also you know the textures for us are interesting as a, a starting point for thinking about uh, the broader issues of the ecology and ecosystems um, and such perhaps we can move to the next the next slide yeah, so this is an image of uh, fishers repairing the canoe. As you can see, the layers of plastic and felt and uh, nails uh, and metal accumulating on the surface through this repair process. Yeah, the next slide, please. Thank you. Yeah, so for us, the materials themselves, the plastic and the metal are, you know, the text, but also because these materials come from commodities on, on whose surfaces are written, you know, different labels and, and you, know, you know, words. We thought this is another layer of, uh, you know, simple text that is brought on the surface of the canoe. So it's simplistically, you can read this text, for example, in this image where you have the motto, as a logo of uh, engine oil, as um, as text that has you know been sedimented on the on the canoe, but beyond that is just the materials themselves being being text. So there are different ways in which you know the text you know uh, manifests on the canoe as as labels on commodities, as um as painted you know statements painted by the, the, the fishers, but also in other, in other different ways. But if, for example, in, in the next slide, perhaps there's a, yeah, yeah. So this is a, this is a very well-known USAID tin can. Uh, it's as a, as a commodity object that's brought on the surface. But on the other, the other slide, there is also another example of uh, the fishers themselves painting on the surface. Yeah, so this is an example of one of our artworks. So we made work to respond to this phenomena of, you know, textuality of the canoe by um, emphasizing on the text to speak on these, you know, larger, larger issues. And this is an example. This is a, a, a screen 
uh, a screen grab of a video of a performance that we did on the lake and uh, the text on the surface is Apa Panaku, which was a found text, which meant that there is there is food here. Uh, but we we uh, like erased part of the statement to make it a nonsensical statement. But just thinking about how you know uh, issues of food, issues of the lake as a source of food would be threatened if say there is oil drilling in the lake. Uh, this is a mask that's paddling, paddling on the sand. Um, just thinking about, you know, yeah, the impending doom. Uh, if we, if if extractivism is allowed to happen, if 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 oil speculation and oil drilling are allowed to happen on the surface, on the lake. Yes. Can you move on to the next? Yeah, and this is another example of an artwork that um, just bringing to the fore the layers, the different layers of the materials on the surface. Um, uh, this is um, the Guardians. So uh, the dugout canoe has been turned into these uh, anthropomorphic figures that are guarding the lake. Uh, but it's also uh, like the four evokes images of the four horses of the apocalypse, you know, emerging from the lake. Um, just speaking to the kinds of impending doom, you know, if uh, the ecosystems are tampered with, uh, if um, the lake as an ecosystem is damaged through, you know, extractivism. Yeah, but it's by upturning the dugout canoe, if we go back, it's by up, upturning the dugout canoe and emphasizing what's underneath that you can see the different, the complex layers of the different materials. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can move on to the next slide. Yeah, this is another example of our work that also, you know, stemmed from the textuality of the canoe. So this is a mask that's submerged, almost submerged in the lake, carrying uh, this placard, uh, which is in the form of paint on wood, a spoil. This is one image in a series uh, titled Submergent you know, Poetry. Um, so there are about eight or nine words playing around the idea of oil. So it's spoil. This is spoil, but there is coil, boil, and other and other words. So the idea was to paint the words on materials that you can find, you'd be sure to find on the surface of the canoe. Yes, you can move on to the next. So that was between 2017 and 2023. But 2023, now we went back to the dugout canoe um, with a different, a different outlook. Uh, now the dugout canoe for us is uh, is a totem. So this is another way of approaching it as a as a three dimensional three dimensional object. As text, we emphasized on its surface, but as totem, it's now sculptural. It stands, and you can walk around it, and it has its own on presence. Um, so yeah, it's the surface, but it's also other things. The canoe holds power, you know, for, you know, for its users, for its owners. Uh, it holds stories of um, the families that, that own the canoe, but also, you know, the societies in which it is, in which it exists. Um, yeah, but you also hear stories of um, of fishers turning into turning into crocodiles when they go out fishing, or turning into fish to be able to to catch fish or to survive. You know, in other words, using magic to 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 survive or to to ensure large catches or to protect themselves uh, from the dangers of the lake because they usually they usually fish at night. So that was an important element for us to consider, uh, like the, the magical elements of, of the dugout canoe. So what we did with this, this project is to take images of the work that we had done before with the canoe, uh, inspired by 
the technologies of, of, of sealing, uh, the aesthetics of uh, repairing the canoe. So we printed images on vinyl and brought them back onto the surface of the canoe. So we had started from the south of the lake um, and then we went to the center and this is in the north. So we're taking images from the, the south and the center and bringing them onto the surface of the canoe. Because while we were in the area projects, thinking about ecological issues and the damage of uh, you know, extractivism and threatened ecosystems, we just thought to, to at this time, to celebrate the dugout canoe itself um, as, a, as a vessel, as a portal, as a useful object, but also as a totem. Yeah, so you can move on to the to the next. Yeah, so this is just literally transforming the dugout canoe, or rather emphasizing its totemic characteristics by standing it um, and adding adding some branches to it. Usually the canoe is just one tree trunk, but we have transformed it here just to 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 magnify, to amplify its its totemic power, so its totemic presence. Uh, next next slide please yeah this is another iteration of you know just thinking about the dugout canoe as totem not a vertical totem but uh you know a totem in multiple multiple directions um so we usually use the tools that you know my tools and materials that the the fishers use like the rope is a is a presence on the on the shore so it comes it figures in in our work to decorate, uh, but also to add its own its own stories on the surface, to add color, decorate, but also, yes. The next slide. Yeah, this is um. This is the dugout canoe as a, as an ancestral space time shadow. So we're just thinking about the the, the dugout canoe as as floating, uh, but we're also thinking about it as a, as a, you know, putting it on a pedestal to celebrate it. Um, but also, you know, the three, like three, three images are compounded in this one image. The one of uh, just imagining the dugout canoe being taken uh, by the flooded waters of the lake and placed in a tree nearby uh, because, you know, of climate change, uh, there are so many apocalyptic images now that we have cyclones coming, uh, the increase of cyclones in the region. Um, yeah, so that image of the dugout canoe, a surreal image of the dugout canoe in a tree, but also an image of a celebratory image of the dugout canoe on a pedestal, just recognizing its 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 utility function and you know the uses that it has served the communities that you know, have used the dugout canoe for ages. Yeah, but also just thinking about the dugout canoe as a space-time shadow. So beyond just being a canoe, as something that can be launched, you know, back into ancestral times, back and forth in the future and in the past and the present. Yes. Um, so recently we had uh, the opportunity to to participate in a residency at Lebec in in Switzerland, where we sought to connect uh, issues of Lake Malawi and issues of um, uh, Lake Geneva through uh, the spirit of the dugout canoe captured in the aesthetics of uh, of repair and the debris or the dr driftwood on Lake Geneva. So as you can see on the walls in this image, um, uh, what we regard as scrolls, the scrolls are borrowing from the aesthetics of, uh, of repair of the patching of the dugout canoe. So we took images of, on vinyl, attached them to driftwood from Lake Geneva um to connect the different lakes but also we found we we were able to acquire a small boat which we we transformed using tar and images on vinyl the images of uh, the surface of the dugout canoe 
broad in the on the surface of this this small board which had sailed on on Lake Geneva, uh, just transforming it to connect these these different stories, you know. So it had a, it has a mast in the form of a vinyl, and floats from uh, from the fishing nets from Lake Malawi. Just to think about how these vastly distanced lacustrine region on the planet seemingly vastly distanced are connected so whatever happens on lake malawi also affects lake geneva and so on and so forth yes but we said a thousand ways to see the malawian dugout canoe because you know usually the dugout canoe is just regarded as you know a utility object um, for fishing or otherwise it's taken and you know people plant flowers and and that's it but we are expanding ways of thinking about it as a totem as text um and all these other other issues other people saw you know abstract abstract images but yeah that's a story for another day let's move on to to the next yeah so we were also able to create an installation on uh, on Lake Geneva, this is uh, echoing the kinds of installation that we we you know we made on Lake Malawi. This is a, a harbinger or bringer of agent tides. Uh, so we just thought of the during the dictatorship in Malawi, uh, the dictatorship, the post-colonial dictatorship after independence, they used to have these Rand Rovers announcing political rallies and you know vaccin vaccinations and stuff those of the Rand Rovers would rush through through townships with these megaphones blasting this you know the the information from you know Minister of Information so we borrowed that and as a as a powerful tool of uh, you know like urgency uh, in our own ways of turning it and putting it on the dugout canoe to speak to the urgent issues of uh, uh, the melting ice, uh, the capital of sin, and all these urgent politi social political issues in connection to the ecology. Yes, next, next slide. Yeah, so, uh, this is another version of uh, of of that installation where the mask rose on the and the boat as um as the harbing as the actual harbing or the bringer of urgent tides. Uh, we were supposed to have sound emanating from the megaphones here, but there were so many restrictions. Unlike the kinds of uh, freedom that we enjoy on Lake Malawi, we didn't have the freedom here to to bring out the installation the way that we had wanted to because it's um, a very restricted environment so no sound blasting from from the installation we're supposed to put the installation in the lake no we're not allowed to do that but we managed to you know uh, play around and were able to you know do a fraction of what we had really imagined to yeah And recently, you know, just just a, f a couple of weeks ago, I was um, invited to University of Minnesota, you know, to interact with the students there. But I was lucky to arrive there at a time when the Center for Community Engaged Learning had an exhibition of um, of uh, the canoes of the Ojibwe people of Minnesota, and showcasing the different canoes and different processes of making the canoes and oh uh, yeah and i just liked the uh the text on the wall you know uh, thinking about the importance of you know the canoe in the present and some of the things that they listed there are what we have been thinking about you know in our engagement with the dugout canoe in malawi uh, so you know it is it is empowering to to learn that there are other communities, you know, distanced communities, but thinking about the same the same things within 
the capital of sin. Yes. I rushed through those images. I don't know if, oh, if, if it makes, it makes sense. It did. It was beautiful. Thank you so much. I loved um, just getting to dive into your work. And, uh, um, you know, we have we have a few minutes and I have a lot of questions, but I'll just ask a couple. Um, and, I, you know, mainly I know this work is ongoing for you or it, and kind of continuing. And so I'm just wondering, like, if you could talk about what you what you carry along or carry forward kind of each from each iteration of the work for yourself as an as an investigator mm. yeah what has been important so far has been um what i would call an, attu an attunement to the three dimensional dimensionality of 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 the dugout canoe uh, of um the different objects that we we work with. Uh, so, as I mentioned, we started with thinking about the surface of the dugout canoe, but now we are we are able to get into the dugout canoe, you know, get out and walk around it, and you know, um, dissect it, and and so on and so forth. So it's um it's a three dimensional, not only in the sense of form, you know, the the form of the canoe, but also. Uh, in the context, you know, the origins of the canoe um, and the stories that it is, it is, um, it is bringing forth. So there is, um, you could say, the economic dimension of the canoe, the social dimension, you know, the cultural or the aesthetic dimension. But there is also, you know, because the, the dugout canoe is prestige to, you know, the people who who own it. So if you own more dugout canoes, you're you're, you're rich, you know, you're well to do, you can rent the dugout canoes and they bring you more money. Um, yeah, but there is, you know, the, the ecological issues that we, you know, we're thinking about because we use it as a springboard to talk about, yeah. talk about the lake. Yeah, but there is also the, the, the spiritual dimension. So it's not just one static, static object. It's, it's an object that's you know saying so much if you approach it from you know like listening to or or, or focusing or you know yeah focusing on its three dimensionality yeah, yeah. And, i mean you've expanded it in space time right with the connection to lake geneva to to just the way in which as you've worked the the work has kind of its reach has expanded in a way that that adds to that dimensionality it seems. yes yes yeah. yeah that's beautiful um so what um maybe a little bit about the the impact that you're like what benefits or impact are you seeing either for yourself as a researcher or 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 within the communities that you're that you're working are you seeing like an impact as you as you move along what kinds of impacts are you noticing well that's 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 quite a challenge because it's um um for what we're interested in you know uh because we are interested in the the communities the fishing community so it's 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 hard really to assess the impact it's because we can't approach it from the a positivist yeah. a positivist outlook so okay you know so this is observable observable reality this is what is happening but we just like the conversations that we we have with the fishers when we are there it's you know in the slide you know i show you images of the canoe but this is just evidence there are so many things going on around it like the, the kinds of um the the meals that we share around you know there are people who help us you know because this 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 the god canoes weigh a ton so you can't move it like the four of you you know you need more people to to move them and you know as we lift the canoes as we cut them as we you know we uh approach the people who own them and you know they give them to us there are conversations that are shared and some of the conversations you know uh, like focus on yeah like 
how the fishers think about oil drilling, for example, mm -hmm. or how they think about the, the dwindling fishing species in the lake, or just, you know, thinking about, you know, the accumulation of plastic in the lake. So, so those kinds of conversations are important for us, even beyond uh, like academic academic conversations that happen later. You know? But in terms of in the academy, you know, we which is secondary, you know, from you know, you know, we are able to to present the work like at um, um, at Lebec in Switzerland. Or, or perhaps in Minnesota, or like in this this kind of conversation, which I think echoes what really happens right, right on the on the shore. Right, but that is the site, and the people at the site are are the life of the, of the definitely, yeah. definitely. So we we are we are just adding on to to there are activists, political activists, or environmental activists who. Uh, you know, engaging these issues, you know, seriously. Uh, marine biologists, you know, and, and, you know, politicians. So we are adding, you know, our conversations from an aesthetic point of view. Right. Even our, even our point of view, aesthetic point of view is a, a kind of a multi, multidisciplinary point of view. It's not just a, a beautiful dugout canoe placed on the, on the shore, because there are other things that we're bringing to, or other other points of view that we're bringing to to this conversation, right? And so the way the you know, an an artist's participation in these conversations, you know, along with scientists or other other activists, um, um, the artworks enable a kind of uh, transformational vision or an intersection of many different elements, like it. I love the way the the artifacts, you know, have these are 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 layered physically with, you know, the the vinyl, the printing, and the the pieces and and um, aspects of the environment kind of plastered on to these these artifacts. And so there's a there's just a way in which I feel like people's understanding can transform in engaging with these objects or witnessing them in this way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's... Well, we hope, we, we're hoping that we're hoping that it's um, you know, uh, because really, you know, people see the dugout canoe on the shore, you know, all the time, but it is not really in Malayan society regarded as such a valuable, you know, a valuable object yeah. beyond the fishing communities, you know, because there are tourists, you know, Malay local tourists going to the lake. You know, but we're hoping that because the, our project has been extensively, you know, uh, featured in in the local newspapers. So perhaps it's starting to change people's mindset regarding the dugout canoe and you know the ecosystem of the lake, you know, in its totality. That's beautiful. I well, we're at time. I would love to keep talking with you. <laughs> Um, and I'm so grateful for for this um, this chance to just engage with the work um, and to just witness you know witness your um, your research as an ongoing practice and a kind of un yes. continually unfolding. I think that's a great thing to to see. hopefully we can have another a longer yes you know, yes position because it's a it's really you know so much to unpack. Yeah. Yes, so much. Well, thank you for even this little bit of time. And um, I so appreciate it. And best of luck with the rest of the semester. All thank right, you. Lisa, take care. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lee Marshall. I'm the Director of Research for the School of the Arts. And I am happy to welcome Susanna Klein to the panelists' space. Welcome, Susanna. Hello, hello. hello. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. How are you? Good. I, I've been feeling I've, you know, I was sitting in on the last one. I've been feeling like uh, waiting for an audition, like nervous, like <laughs> waiting to play. Next. Yeah. Yikes. Yes. 
Well, um, I have I have your slides. Let me know if you would like to just speak a little bit to begin, and if you want me to to share in, in advance for you, I will do that. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll let you know. Uh, it's just a few times. I, I don't have a whole lot. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. I don't know who's out there, but thanks for for joining us. Um, I'm happy to be here talking about a little bit of what I do in the research capacity at VCU. Um, I'm an associate professor of violin here in the music department, and so obviously my passion is music. Um, but music wasn't always my focus. Uh, when I was in high school, I was way more into sports, and I was on the track team and the swim team, and I only practiced the violin the bare minimum amount to get by. And I think my violin teacher would say that I probably practiced less than the bare minimum to get by. Um, my swim coach, Miss Cross, was amazing. Um, she drove us really hard, but with a lot of love. And she did some wacky things with the team. Um, one of her uh, famous things was that in practice, we all had to wear pantyhose under our swimsuit. So we would take a pair of pantyhose, cut off the feet so we wouldn't slip while walking poolside put that on under the suit, which you can imagine is quite uncomfortable, <laughs> and then do all of our practices with that. And then when, we were, when it was race time, when we were competing, the pantyhose came off, which made us faster in the water because we weren't as waterlogged as we were with the pantyhose. But more importantly, it made us feel faster, just getting out of the starting gate, which was an amazing feeling. Um, there's another kind of crazy thing that she would do that I only have come to understand. Uh, now as part of kind of what I do here, which is when we would compete against a really weak team, she would ask all of us to switch strokes and swim in races that weren't naturally our own. So instead of backstroke, which was my usual stroke, I had to swim butterfly races, um, which I should add is like a near drowning experience for me. It was then, it still is today. Um, but this way we would beat um, a really weak team, like, I don't know, 93 to 77, something like that, not 100 to zero, right? So Miss Cross was looking out for every single swimmer in Baltimore City, where I went to high school, not just our own team. And through sports, I became fascinated with the human body. I loved the quest for greatness and for excellence, and I wanted to study medicine. Um, I did an internship at University of Maryland Hospital, where I worked in the operating room as a kind of technician, bring, bring supplies and stuff. Um, and there I marveled at the resilience of the human body. The summer before my senior year, however, I had a transformative experience during a symphony rehearsal, like almost like a religious experience, but with art. And I knew just like that, that I had to pursue music. And that evening I cried. I cried because I knew I was an ugly little duckling in music, or if you want to put it more politely, um, I was a late bloomer, you could say. I had no confidence in my violin playing, and why should I? After all, I wasn't very good. Uh, I was a much better runner and swimmer than I was a violinist. And as a music major in college, I engaged in hours and hours of what I now call self-abusive practice. I left the practice room only when I truly couldn't stand it anymore. Often uh, when I was angry, upset, or frustrated, um, I practiced literally until my bottom lip would turn numb because I was cutting off the um, su blood supply. Um, I practiced until I couldn't turn my head in either direction because my neck was so stiff. And I practiced desperately all the way through my undergrad and then all the way through grad school. And then to my surprise, when it was all said and done, I got a job as a symphony violinist. And then I got another job. And then I got another job. And every time I was surprised. Um, but I still, because I still felt like the ugly little duckling inside, right? I felt unworthy. I was just never good enough for me. I was not, I was not enough. And after a decade working as an orchestral violinist full time, I had practiced my way right into some chronic injuries and my shoulder, my right shoulder just completely wore out. And that's when I came to VCU as a professor. Um, and thank goodness for many reasons. Um, I loved it from the start. 
it's it's a thrill to be training that next generation of violinists, but also it has led to all this research that is, um, I think, helping people out in the field, but maybe most of all helping me myself as a player. So shortly after I was hired in 2011, um, the VCU basketball team had their like dazzling Cinderella run, uh, which took them all the way to the final four in March Madness. And I followed the team and I became particularly obsessed with their coach, Shaka Smart. So Shaka has a really unusual uh, coaching style. He uses a lot of psychology. He had a psychology minor in college and he uses very unusual tactics. He's a, he's a maverick in the field. And my own high school sports experiences came flooding back to me as I was following the team. I started dreaming of what unusual coaching could be like in the music arena for learning music. Because you see violin playing and sports actually have a lot of co in common both are highly dependent on excellent form what we call in music technique. Um, and both basketball and violin playing are highly visual so it's easy as a teacher or a coach to explain the how and why to your students, when you can see the what. And that summer I applied for a teaching grant through VCU Center for Teaching and Learning Excellence, which supports professors in innovative teaching. That's kind of a short summary of what they do. But my grant focused on violin lessons, which is that one on one time for an hour where violin majors study with the master, in this case me, um, that all violin majors have to do kind of all their semesters during during their years here. And the title of my project was it's all in the game what music can learn from sports. Um, the grant allowed me to buy some teaching tools and research equipment and here's what I spent uh, some of my money on I bought a lot of sports psychology books and workbooks. Uh, I installed giant mirrors in many of the practice rooms here in the music building I wanted to mimic what dancers have that kind of whole wall of mirrors. Um, and I bought a handful of iPads, first generation iPads, so that we could use that in video work. I was, in the beginning at least, very focused on excellence and mastery. So mastery for us is amazing sound, scales, things that are in tune, fast fingers, right? My central questions were, how could players get better more quickly, right? Work more efficiently. How could students see themselves more objectively? and notice their flaws without a teacher having to talk about everything. How could students drive themselves to work smarter? I wanted my students to progress faster and with less practice. After all, if they could progress with fewer hours of practice, then they could avoid my injuries, right? And most importantly, they could get rid of that menacing feeling that I'd always had, that I was just never good enough. As part of my uh, research with students, I experimented with a lot of technology. All of this is kind of borrowed from sports and cinema, um, but this tech was new kind of in the music arena. So we got into VCU's motion capture lab, right, to look for better form. Um, we work with all sorts of sports apps uh, for self analysis. You can uh, forward a couple slides, uh, or at least one. There you go. There's me working with a student with, a, with an app. Um, we experimented with virtual reality you can go forward again um, that was kind of a, a interdisciplinary project with another class in the school of the arts and eventually i developed a practice app uh, that we used in research not here at vcu but at other universities and you can forward again lee um, and the app uh, was designed to help me understand as a researcher what are those tools go for one more, one more time what are those what are those tools and what are those habits of musicians that can help students progress faster we use some good old fashioned tools um, journals journaling, which is what elite athletes do. I thought that if I could figure out how to unlock unlock mastery right in my students as quickly as possible, they would just live happily ever after. But I was wrong, and in fact, what I found out was that the quest for excellence as kind of a single minded goal can lead to a toxic pattern of more insecurity and self-loathing. Now, sports psychologists would have just said to me, like, duh, what's new? But I was learning all these things, right? Um, 
I could see that spirits in my studio violinists kind of waxed and waned, depending on how I as a teacher approach their work, what I asked them to do. So here's an example. Um, early on, I was interested in students recording themselves for biofeedback, because we know that's really good for them, right? And my prompt was video record your entire one hour lesson, go home, rewatch the lesson, take notes on what you observed, and turn them into me. Uh, students hated that. <laughs> it was boring. It was long. It was overwhelming. And essentially, I was forcing students to relive an hour where they were being endlessly criticized and nitpicked, because that's what a private lesson is, after all, right? It is an hour of critique, constructive, hopefully positive, but nevertheless critique. So later, I changed this exact prompt to read something like this. In practice, video record one short phrase of playing. After watching it, practice a couple improvements and record again. Watch the second recording and revise again. Make one last short video of the same passage. So this time, the recording assignment took about 15 minutes. It was less threatening. It was autonomous. And most importantly, it was empowering. So that third recording is always tons better than the first recording, right? And so students could see their gains. They could experience a win. And I noticed that feeling good about their work was possible even when excellence was not there yet. But once they felt empowered, they could do that patient, often grueling work, right? That bit by bit work that leads to excellent violin playing. Empowerment had to come first. So I like to say feeling empowered is the stepping stone to mastery. And I started turning into kind of a habit psychologist, right? I wanted to know what made musicians tick, what challenged them in just the right way, and what could uh, push them through obstacles, right? What could inspire them? So I started to assign journal prompts like this. Describe in detail your earliest memory as a musician. This allowed players to tap into their kind of initial crush on music, and with it came often inspiration, motivation, and a renewed sense of purpose or passion. And now that painstaking work came much more easily to them. I focused less on scales and arpeggios, and uh, I started to focus on other things. I tried to spur students' creativity, which I'll define as being able to problem solve independently, right? Make their practice interesting to express themselves. I devised activities to foster resilience, to recover from failure quickly, to take more risk on in the first place, to be daring, to go for it. I, I tried to curate optimism. I wanted them to dream big, to believe in their potential, at least their trajectory, and to be able to beat back the inner critic every day to have grace with themselves, to have a sense of humor. And I could see that making their gains visible would tilt them towards the positive. And optimism is, make, is key for making magic happen and getting out of our own way. Um, I helped them hone their discipline to show up regularly, right? And to focus on the most important work. I warned against chasing shiny objects or to repeat measures endlessly and mindlessly. And I told them to please stop watching the clock, which is a very common thing in music, practice this many hours. Um, I tried to get them connected to others on their journey. I learned that cultivating community purposefully is one of the most important teaching skills, which I hadn't known before. I thought I was just here to teach the violin. Um, I spent a lot of time gamifying hard work, right? Gamifying makes difficult tasks less daunting and it makes us patient. It also gets around what I uh, sometimes call the other F word, failure. In a gamified approach, we are less afraid of failing. And when we're less afraid, again, magical things can happen. Um, I experimented with stretching students out of their comfort zone in itty bitty increments, right? Not too hard, not too easy, just right. And all of this I had to learn for my students and perhaps most of all for myself. So my high school fascination with sports and medicine, I think, was on track. I just needed to concentrate on the most powerful part of the body, the spirit, 
right? The mind, the brain, whatever you want to call that. Um, Lee, you can help me again with a few more slides. Um, in terms of concrete research outcomes, right? Because research is supposed to culminate in something, not just me musing in my head, but this is what some of that work led to. Um, I published a workbook that's with all the experience of journaling with my students. Um, it's called Practisma, the Practisma Practice Journal, 16 Weeks of Efficiency, Empowerment, and Joy for Musicians. Um, next slide. Um, that's still the journal. That's the kind of a picture of the inside of it. Um, the, the journal prompts are partly doing, partly thinking, reflection, again, workbook oriented kind of for all musicians, not just violinists of all kinds. Um, you can forward again. Um, I published an app uh, on the iOS store called Clipsa, and what Clipsa allows you to do is like if you're a high skilled performer, sports, artists, public speakers, whatever, um, you can easily see what you just did the last 30 seconds by just tapping the screen. Um, forward again. Um, and I think that's it in terms of slides. You can crush the slides again. Thank you so much. Um, and I've written a lot of articles about all the topics that I've talked to you about today. And I've taught a lot of workshops for students uh, here and at other universities. Um, and I call all of that like soft research. Um, I still do some academic research, uh, but more than anything, I blog and I vlog and I write for a lot of uh, popular musician magazines, not necessarily academic peer reviewed journals because I wanna spread the word that efficiency is good, but empowerment and joy, that's where it's at, right? That is what sustains us as human beings. And that's what motivates us to dig deep. And I think feeling empowered in our journey is important for all of us, not just musicians. It's not an afterthought or a byproduct or some kind of bonus that you get to once you are in fact really good at what you're trying to do. Empowerment is the stepping stone to magic. It is the main ingredient. And uh, that's some of what I have to share about my research, which has less and less to do with violin playing and more to do with human nature. Susanna, that's, that's so wonderful to, to, to hear this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna add myself in, here we are um, together just, for this conversation part, um, thank you so much. And I, I, I'm really struck by, I mean, I have a script, but I'm gonna go off script. <laughs> like I'm really struck by just the way in which what you shared, we have these terms for things as if they are separate research, practice, teaching, you know, all these things. And I love the way what you're sharing weaves those things together so that, so that practice as research or vice versa um, that that there's this arc that you're carrying forward as an artist, but then but then the kind of the way that it permeates um, your teaching practice and and just um, embodies the the notion of research as practice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, That's yeah, I, and I think you know for me it starts from teaching, yeah, and then kind of goes into research, and then goes into teaching again. And then like it's kind of a buoy, but it, it does actually for me often start in the lesson or in the classroom right I, I will try something with students. And am struck by what happens, and then I will go research a lot like what do social scientists say about this, what do psychologists say about you know I don't know the value of play or the value of surprise or you know. Um, then I kind of do some research so there's this sort of buoy effect then I put in more to teaching. And then at some point I'm able to formulate those things into writing or an article or a book or something like that, if that makes any sense. But the genesis is usually with students for me, for sure. And, and it sounds like also you are cultivating within students, like practice as research, like they, that, that their practice is an investigation in how to, right? How yes. To. yes, always. Yeah, 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 always. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, sometimes they, they're not aware that I'm also researching these things, right? They just think, oh, 
Susanna says, go have a good time or, or do this. Do you know what I mean? They, they, don't, they sometimes don't know that it's part of a grander plan. And um, I think maybe that's good. You know, I don't want them to feel like they're guinea pigs. Um, but in fact, they are guinea pigs. <laughs> right, inevitably. Yes. Yeah. So what, um, what, do you, what do you, I mean, you've spoken a little bit about sort of the way um, you've seen students the way students respond to how you've changed, you know, change your approach, but what could you speak, maybe speak more broadly about the benefits or the impacts of, of this work that you, that you see unfold in yourself and your students, you know, or in the field, um, the larger field, if that's, if that's possible. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I've, I've become really convinced because violin playing is a, is a pretty tricky, highly technical, um, you know, discipline. There are many disciplines like this, but I think I've become convinced that we don't spend enough time in education, whether that's at the collegiate level or certainly at the high school level, um, really talking about developing dispositions and training the brain. I think there's a lot of focus on knowledge, gaining knowledge, you know, but like I can use chat GBT right now and get some knowledge, right? Like so much is readily uh, available. And I'm not sure that we as a society are making that transition to, to really talk about all in on like igniting passion, right? Mm -hmm. um, curating experiences to, to have students be more creative, to have them be more resilient, right? Or more daring, uh, more optimistic, to develop discipline in a certain way right, to connect to community. And, you know, I'm very opinionated about this, but like now I think that everything that we could do, if we can really engage as teachers at all the different levels in this discussion, I think there's every field can benefit from it. And, and we'd all be happier for it. I think students would be more engaged. I think we do a really great job of it in, in elementary school. There's a lot of creative activity um, and a lot of free freedom and, you know, to do that. But then at some point we just get really serious about learning and learning becomes this sort of acquisition of knowledge. And students can solve a lot of those, if they have good mentors in teaching, they can solve a lot of those le learning problems themselves um, if they're truly hungry, but it's making them hungry and making them resilient to take on that risk. That is really, um, I think that's where we should be. I think that's where there needs to be more attention. There is some attention. Angela Duckworth has written a lot, um, but I still feel like, you know, there could be so much more. In terms of violin specifically or music, I would just also love um, for there to be, and I'm trying to, you know, be a part of this, to really have tech development in music. Because I see, I see in, in my players over and over and over again, when something is quantifiable for them, and sports already does this, right, with all the gadgets that they have, but when things are quantifiable in music, which is very, very rare, but students feel empowered, you know, so I kind of look forward to the day when you can be like, oh, you know, Jane, your bow speed this week, you know, you are getting to an even slower bow speed, which is really hard for us. You know, you, you're you getting 5% slower than you did last week. Good job. I think that would empower them and would make them train more efficiently. Um, so that, that psychology piece for musicians, which really isn't there yet, um, and the technology piece, which is also not there for musicians. I, for, for my particular field, I would I would love that. I would love to see that. Yeah, it's banned. So you, well, you sort of are answering this, but but just thinking about like where your curiosity is taking you now. Like there are things that you you would love to see happen, but for you, like where, what are you finding new pathways right now? Like what's um yeah, I mean they're all related. I'm doing a um kind of exciting project with the School of Engineering right now where we are um kind of messing around with some i'll call them wearables but they're not really wearables they they actually go on the equipment mm -hmm. of a violin to be able to show bow speed in real time to be able to show the angles between the violin and the bow in real time which is something we train endlessly as as violinists um 
And that's really fun because the data is all there with three axis sensors. Like you can get all that data. You can show the angles. You can show how fast a, a, a bow is moving. Um, rendering that in real time so that it's meaningful for, for musicians, that, that's really hard. But that's, that's a project that I've always dreamed of and that's finally happening. Um, like after 10 years of kind of it living in my head or drawing sketches. Um, so that's one thing. And I've been thinking about, I don't know if I should say it out loud, but because I write so many articles and, you know, I don't know, I write things down for myself a lot. I, I've been thinking about the back of my head at some point, um, writing a book just about practice and empowerment, like the kind of psychology of practice. Because I think there is a lot about performance anxiety, how to perform better under pressure, but I don't think there's really much of anything or not enough about that other piece. But um, it's it's mostly, it's simmering <laughs> up here. And I'm just kind of thinking at some point I will have enough together and we'll have to bite the bullet and do that. Okay, you said it and we were quiet. Yep. You said, I hope nobody was listening. <laughs> Hold me to it. <laughs> um that would be that's amazing but yeah i mean the the notion of practice of course is expansive it applies to across across disciplines and this question these questions i think feel relevant for dancers and and for um artists anything that's hard artists. you know if it's worth right. doing it's hard but are there ways that we can make it less hard you yeah. know feeling and, more empowered right like how to strive without um yeah, how to strive without kind of the assumption being that you're, you know, you're not good enough, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is tricky because you're not. Yeah, how, how it's like how to aspire, but without shaming, right? You know? Right. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's a thing that we don't, you know, our culture doesn't really know how to do very well yet. Mm -hmm. um, or, or I think it's, it's changing or evolving, but, the, but your work is very much pointing to that as, um, it's beautiful, and I, I, I yeah, I'm, I'm drawing a lot of dance parallels, but I don't want to derail us. Um, yeah, yeah, but it's all the same because yeah. you know your body has to function in space, right? And if you have a lot of dance, um, I don't know, like crippling self doubt at the moment that you're moving, like your body yeah. will not, right? You know, it's like figure skating and all that stuff. Like it's not going to cooperate. You know, it's not going to do. Your the image in your mind is is quite tainted. It's it's you're going to get in your own way. So yeah, absolutely. Right. It makes me think about the you know we have this body mind dichotomy as if they are separate things, and in an art form, really a lot of what you're learning is that it's all it, it, the, it's it's uh, all it's yeah the, it's all one, and you know what the brain believes the body achieves, right? So like right. you're not going to do something different than what you really believe right. is about to happen or could happen. Right. Yeah, it's very powerful. Pretend like you're an expert. Fake. <laughs> right. Um, well, we're very, very much toward the end of our time, but uh, is there anything else that's coming up for you as we're talking? Any, anything else you want uh, No, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing some of these, you know, um, in recorded format because I'm, I'm teaching, I'm having to miss a lot, but I'm, it, it's always inspiring to me to hear about other people's work because that's that's how I get ideas you know they don't just come to me it's like they float by me so I'm I'm really excited to see what what some other people have been up to yeah great oh thank you oh wait I see Sean Brixey is here and says along with performance anxiety deeply trained experts often suffer from performance dystonia okay yeah um you know, it's like a dystonia or I, I, I call it like dysmorphia too, you know, where how we actually are. I mean, like for me, I have a, you know, I have a good job in the arts and there's still it's and, and everybody is like this. It's like, I'm not good enough. I'm not this. I'm a fraud. I'm a whatever, um, yeah. you know, and some of this is OK, but when it really does get in your own way and you sort of pathologize it and think there's something wrong with me. I think yeah. that that can that can be pretty serious and we we could be just I think unlocking people's potential more easily or just make them happier that's a worthy goal too. 
That's fine. Yes, it's beautiful. All right. Well, thank you so much. I really thank you. Thanks for asking me to asking me to come. Have a great rest of your semester. Thank you. You too. So much. Okay. Once again, if you're just joining, my name, I feel like I'm on the radio. My name is Lee Marshall. I am Director of Research for the School of the Arts, and I'm glad to welcome Sean Brixey to this space, our um, Professor of Kinetic Imaging and former Dean of VCU Arts. And Sean, I'm going to spotlight you. I was just um, uh, you know, enjoying the previous conversation with uh, Susanna and the notion of uh, performance dystonia. I had a very good friend who is a classical guitarist, you know, who played at like the absolute highest level. Um, and at a certain point, you can actually perform so long that your brain filters it out and you can no longer remember how to play. It's not a kind of um, uh, aphasia uh, or, um, you know, a cognitive decline. It basically just stops it. And you're, it's a little bit like, you know, living in New York and you have a car alarm going off and you just, you know, hear it outside and then pretty soon you just shut it off. And after a while, <laughs> it just disappears. Uh, and I was just fascinated sort of with the last part of that conversation. Well, thanks everybody. Uh, and thanks um, Lee for inviting uh, me. Um, I really enjoyed the original uh, conversation that we had at the ICA. Um, and uh, the people who have you know, written me and asked about my work since then. And I just thought this idea of Research Rewind was like super fun. Uh, and I was really glad to participate. Um, what I thought I would do is basically, you know, just talk a little bit about what I presented there and then kind of dive into the newer work. Uh, but because it is about research and some of your questions asked about students and other things like that, it really had me thinking sort of, you know, historically and how these things happen. And the quality of research, the research engagement at research universities. Um, so, you know, some of, let's just say the slides that I have sort of reflect that. So I'll jam through quite a few slides really quickly in about 10 minutes, and then we'll have our conversation and, and hopefully it will be uh, fruitful and everyone will enjoy. So I think um, in, along with uh, Lee's introduction, um, my research explores the synthesis primarily of art design, engineering, physics, cosmology, biology, and computing. I sometimes say that I create works that let others explore real locations remote from their true location, and only to find in many cases that they have this uncanny sense of familiarity and uh, awakening to the, the reality that they had already been there once I got them there. Um, I'll outline some key strategies that I have used and pursued primarily on the focus of concepts around telematics. Um, and uh, the word telematics really came out of the 1980s with one of the procedural embodiments called telepresence. And it was coined by Marvin Minsky, one of my professors at MIT, in reference really to the teleoperations of manipulating um, remote physical systems. And uh, if you really filtered it down, it really is the experience of being in a real location remote from one's true location. Or if you filter it down even more, it really just simply means being there, right? And um, I came to sort of my passion or interest in this legitimately because my parents were television producers and growing up on the floor of a TV studio, I actually thought until I was, you know, pretty old <laughs> that they teleported people. And I was really excited about that. You know, it's living during the era of the Apollo program, we're landing on the moon. Uh, and I was uh, probably, you know, heartbroken and shattered to find out that they actually didn't do that. But that stuff stayed with me my entire life. Um, went on to the Kansas City Art Institute and a little bit more like we do in the science and engineering, because I'm also a faculty in cinema and in engineering. Um, you, uh, when I, where I went to art school, they actually um, apprenticed you, right? You were a protege of a particular artist, and I worked with Dale Eldred on these very large monumental uh, light projects that dealt with the position of the earth and the sun, um, uh, the planets and scale. We would take over whole museums and do these really monumental projects. And there was the sense of monumentality that he had that really seemed to never touch on the notion of the intimate, right? It was always on big scale things and not that you could sort of point in the same direction. My work really changed and required me to head off to a place that was not a traditional art school because I couldn't make the things that I wanted. So I went to the media lab 
at MIT. I was lucky <clears throat> to apprentice with or be protege to Steve Benton. All of you have uh, holograms on your credit cards uh, and your wallet. Uh, also with uh, Jerry Kepish, who was uh, the protege of um, Mahali Naj, uh, uh, Otto Pina, um, uh, and of course, Doc Edgerton, all of these folks were my thesis advisors and I spent a lot of time with them. I also did a lot of work with uh, Nemju Pike and Charlotte Mormon and John Cage. Uh, spent a lot of time in academia and I, I, I really thought before I showed these slides that I, I wanted to think about research, Lee, and like where all of this sort of you know happens and it often happens, the kinds of experimentation in the arts really happen in these large academic institutions, not all of it, there's lots of studios out there. Um, so I did my postdoc Leonardo Fellowship at the University of Michigan, went on to Cranbrook, went on to the University of Kentucky, mostly building and leading new programs that were sort of at the intersection of interdisciplinary art forms, primarily art science, engineering, um, dance, architecture, um, uh, et cetera, uh, San Francisco State University, and then on to Cal Berkeley to build sort of the uh, the progenitor of the next uh, program, which is the PhD program that I built uh, at the University of Washington Center for Digital Arts and Experimental Media, which is the first PhD of its kind, right? So this is all really like research. So not only making my work, but building opportunities for other people, right? To be able to do similar pioneering work. And then on to um, uh, York University in Canada, and now here at uh, uh, BCU. Um, I'm probably not as prodigious as my colleagues. They show a lot. Um, most of my work takes about five years per project. I show mostly in museums as commissions, things like uh, places like Documenta, uh, Yeshiva University, the European Capital of Culture, um, uh, the Winter Olympics in Nagano, Japan. Uh, my research really requires a flotilla of people, you know, to help and support and be participants. And my goal often is to enroll their imaginations, right, uh, in the process of my creative work. In terms of research frontiers, uh, some of the, um, I'll just say the key sort of um, thoughts that um, are important to understand in my work is uh, simulation versus emulation. And when I was in art school, I, you know, I was still in a Beaux-Arts art school, even though it was experimental. And so painting, printmaking, uh, and sculpture were really the, you know, penultimate canon. Uh, and that's where you resided. And the problem was, is I was very good at drawing uh, and painting, uh, but the, um, uh, I, I always felt like I was never able to make the work. Uh, that was in the picture, right? I could draw it, but I wanted the thing itself. And so in the middle, which is a low level emulation, which is a plastic apple, right? It's a higher order of implementation than a simulation that might cost a million dollars. And on the far right hand side, high level emulation is actually a real apple. And so how do you get there other than propagation where you just beget it, right? The other thing is this notion that humans are more than just 100-year biological vessels. We're million-year creatures embedded in a billion-year process. And if I'm going to make art for this different kind of you know, creature, how would I actually make art for who we were, who we are, and who we will become? And that doesn't always reside in an art museum. Now, this is an equation that may seem a little out there, but if you go all the way to the left, that's just plain old C. That's the constant C of the speed of light. That's Maxwell's equation, which of course begets us E equals MC square. And this notion that I wanted to build artwork that was valid for all inertial frames of reference. That means my work at any point in time in history, right? To the beginning of time, to the end of time, at any scale that you are actually works. It functions, it behaves, it does all the things that it needs to, but it changes our relationship to it because some of the things that it does, we can't really see, right? So one of the basic postulates of special relativi relativity is the speed of light. The uh, speed of light in a vacuum is the same for all observers drifting through gravity th free space and more precisely for all inertial frames of reference. So how do you make works of art for all inertial frames of reference? That's sort of where I come from. So I built a lot of projects. Photon Voice was a national endowment for the arts funded project that created this 94 million mile transmission line between the sun and the earth to use radiation pressure to actually levitate uh, graphite particles in a vacuum chamber that a, a dancer would perform and move with in relationship to the sun and the earth and these tiny particles, changing the um, interaction of photons with electrons and matter to produce these incredible sort of, you know, um, 
uh, let's just say galaxies. This is when the Van der Waals forces break. This is when it starts to form a flat oblate disk, exactly like you have in deep space. It begins to look a lot like a galaxy, right? Each one of the particles spinning the same way that a planet does, uh, and reflected light comes off of them, uh, producing this incredible sound. It's really similar to the way that an ice skater works, uh, the same sort of momentum that you get when you move. Um, the, another project that I did, Sky Chasm, which was Documenta 8, uh, it was an environmental installation where uh, museum visitors actually created time travel differences between quantum phase and tangled photon pairs. And, and while that sounds maybe a little bit elaborate, you can kind of think of it as this, is that I built, uh, if any of you are familiar with um, the Michelson and Morley experiment and Sir Arthur Eddington, which proved general relativity, um, I built an elaborate uh, modification to what's called a uh, interferometer. And uh, this interferometer is not like the Michelson interferometer, nor is it like the kind that we use in holography, where you bounce part of the light off of an object and part of the light goes directly to a holographic plate and you record a three-dimensional image. It actually allowed for tiny time travel differences to be measured between uh, a single photon that had been split into two paths. And when they come back together, they form an interference pattern. You can't put a sticky note on a photon and say, I was here because it would take all the energy in the universe, right? Uh, to actually accelerate it to the speed of light. So I sort of did this hat trick that had not been done before and made one of the beams, the carrier of the experience of the performance. So this image right here is actually magnified about 250 million times. If you were the same size as the sun to your body, one of those black rings would be the same size as you to the sun. So this is very, very small. The scalar distance is absolutely massive. It's beyond you know, imagination. And then the performance would be transmitted through these transmitters uh, that would be decoded or um, received by people anywhere from close to about seven kilometers away. The surface of the mirrors on the speakers look like this, and they carry amplitude modulated light. You can see in the distance, there's a really bright light source. Uh, I did a project for the European um, uh, Union called Voltaire, where I cloned um, uh, ice core samples from the last glacial maximum. And it's really like a time machine because it's not really thousands of years old. It's actually thousands of years ago because it's brand new. It just was made. But Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, you know, uh, notwithstanding, it's an exact clone of, uh, <laughs> of 20,000 years ago. So I brought in ice core samples and built, uh, you know, very special freezer. And instead of doing what nature does, which is letting ice crystals grow through dissipation of heat, supersaturation, super te uh, um, and uh, uh, temperature uh, gradients, I was able to make ice crystals that don't look like ones in your refrigerator, right? I'm not sure anybody has uh, ice cubes at home that look like this. Um, and then very, build very special environments that allow for these um, uh, ice crystals to occur. And then they themselves uh, are exact copies. You can make clones of clones of clones of clones. And so the idea that an artist would be hubristic enough to clone a glacier uh, is only surpassed by sort of human stupidity uh, that we would create an environment where we would have to do that as a reflection on thinking about where we live, right? The air that we breathe, the things that are disappearing in front of us every day. Another project, Altamira, uh, uses electrodes on either side of your head attached to something not unlike a cell phone and then um, connects uh, to a radio telescope uh, that looks, you know, uh, deep, deep, deep into space and uh, looks at pulsars and brings the signal in into uh, the basically the back of the retina to stimulate it to produce phosphines. Uh, but because they're multiplex, they produce this hallucinogenic experience that's really derived from our connection, our telematic connection with something uh, 125 million years ago, yet however our brain immediately understands it. Another project that I did was called Eon, uh, which uses voice modulated high frequency ultrasound uh, in a jar uh, to create a star. There's high pressure um, uh, uh, ultrasound nodes that create almost like a force field and an X and it crushes it at near relativistic speeds. I split apart oxygen and hydrogen and then a bubble forms 
uh, based on people typing in almost like uh, uh, Twitter tweets and your voice is converted into the pressure wave that produces the light. And the interesting thing about the light is when you put it through a prism, normally you would have absorption or emission lines, right? We would know that it was hydrogen and oxygen, but this particular um, uh, light source actually is a pure black body. It means it's coming from somewhere that's not in the glass, right? It's from somewhere else. So the idea that your words are begetting light, not turning a light switch off and on, uh, like many light artists do, but actually beginning it from places that we really don't know where it comes from. And then I'm just looping into the work that I'm working on right now. Uh, uh, because I had spent so much time with Minsky on the idea of experiencing real locations remote from your true location, the idea of being there, uh, if you change a single letter, you actually change the ontological meaning of the entire idea to being here. It only takes one letter. It sounds like it's philosophical, but you know, COVID did a lot of things to us. I'll never make it to Mars. We all won't, right? It's either billionaires or superhumans. And so this notion of an experience of being in a real location remote from one's true location really became the experience of a remote location being present in one's true location. How do you bring, right? Uh, how, it shifts from going from a place to where you're not to bringing uh, that place to where you are. And it sounds very simple, but all of us do telepresence always from this sort of conceptual idea. And so was born this project called Magnaforma, uh, which combines elements of sort of industrial robotics, computer science, data visualization, curiosity, AI, all of this to actually, in a, in a giant robotic arm to physically create the entire surface topography of Mars here on Earth, 144 million square kilometers. So we're teleporting Mars here uses NASA orbiter data from planetary missions. The robotic arm explores the planet's surface, assembling sort of a three-dimensional color rendering of Mars, and it takes five years to do it. The research development focused on a specialized multi-language, multi-system robot animation software that integrates mixed reality, real-time LED visualization, sensing and control systems for industrial one-arm robots rather than mobile robots. We use Unity for mixed reality animation programming integrated with Raspberry very high for the LED controls. And we use uh, sort of the um, recording of the robot's Cartesian position on a virtual topic 3D map uh, that then replays it in real space to the exact 3D surface position and of the planet contours via the robotic arm while simultaneously transmitting all the color photogrammetry uh, through addressable LEDs that basically uh, come from the surface atmosphere so the terrain and atmosphere rendering use color-coded systems, basically the x-axis with the surface terrain representing values below y and the atmosphere for those above uh, uh, zero, which correspond to sort of the topographic um, uh, colors that you'd see. Then we developed in the lab prepackaged, I'll show you some videos in a second, uh, terrain segments that are accessible through this sort of mixed reality interface uh, so that we can work on uh, um, uh, the process. Let's see, this is the project in situ. I, I liken it to a cross between sort of the monumentality, the poetic monumentality of uh, Smithson. Um, of course, uh, 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 William Forsyth, right? Uh, and his, uh, uh, some of his projects, uh, even Maya Lin on her systematic landscapes. Um, it's a bit of a boundary object, uh, and it, you know, even reminds me uh, in some ways of, of Rothko. It's also like a meticulously crafted film, like a motion picture film, but it's in three-dimensional space, right? And the story is born in three space rather than of a narrative fiction. There's all kinds of, you know, uh, natural collaborative research elements that go with it, augmented reality, you know, robots moving into everything from theme parks to into our laboratories and the arts. Uh, to, you know, even making it as easy and rapidly reconfigurable as uh, we would have with a game controller. Uh, to build the project, a lot of research activity, we had to build an off-site lab, uh, really large undertaking just to get the project up and going. That's why they take, you know, many, many years, aerospace, aluminum, you know, parts, uh, custom computers. I have lots of graduate students working with me from engineering. Uh, you can see uh, we're working on the um, uh, prototype system here with the motion of the planchette basically being done by hand, the, the robot by hand instead of uh, by the, the system itself. 
um, working with the choreography. Uh, I'll just back up one slide and then we're almost done. Well, for some reason it didn't want to play. Anyway, uh, we're controlling the robot basically through uh, uh, a mixed reality interface. This doesn't look like, uh, you know, especially to you, <laughs> like dance performance and choreography, but, you know, robots, they need a lot of work to learn uh, certain things that they are not familiar with. And I don't want to anthropomorphize them too much, but, um, you know, here it is at a much more advanced level uh, with a, a different kind of robot that's using um, curiosity algorithms to study the surface of the planet, right? And learn how it wants to travel rather than it being sort of just uh, prescribed how to get there. Uh, this is the big robot learning uh, surface topography. Now you can see uh, when I was talking earlier, the lower part, which looks sort of orange, is really the, the, the surface of the planet. You can see how three-dimensional shapes are taking place. Then there's the horizon and then the atmosphere up above. Lots of design work that goes on uh, to be able to achieve this. Um, video monitors don't come, you know, even video walls, right, to be able to do this. Uh, so very uh, um, uh, specifically designed um, uh, LED monitors have to be uh, constructed. Even the receivers and the um, hardware have to be designed uh, with special specifications for movement, for temperature. The photogrammetry or the color surface of the planet is really changing everywhere, right? It's constant. So the robot won't just, you know, reproduce like a single set of colors. Uh, it's always sort of as it's migrating, it moves around the planet and uh, is constantly changing. Uh, but that's kind of it. That's what I thought, you know, I would share with you and see, you know, what was inspiring, uh, what maybe uh, uh, questions or ideas that we wanted to talk about. Yeah, that's um, that's beautiful. Thank you, Sean. Um, your work is obviously incredibly complex, and the scale is is um, vast. And so, one thing I, you know, I have this script of questions that I keep I keep falling off the map because I want to ask people specific <laughs> things. But um, you, you anybody early, else can ask too. Yeah, yeah. Early on, you said something about um, in the work you were doing, sort of in your apprenticeship time in grad school, and how you felt that something that was missing was the the notion of the intimate and I would love to hear like how how that's carried for like do you feel like your 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 own work or your current or recent work has has kind of inter interacted with this idea of the intimate and how yeah I think you know it comes from like being with uh, in an era where you know sculpture when it's when you're in great doubt, make it big. When you're in greater doubt, make it red. When you're in greater doubt, right, you pack it inside of big semi-tractor trailers and it takes like a circus or an army to build that. And I had told this story many times that I was uh, left behind on a research uh, trip uh, in the middle of uh, the desert. And I uh, put a quarter in a gumball machine and out fell a tiny little Bible and it was so small, right? And, uh, but yet it was so big. And so I, I came up with this notion that I really wanted to explore all of these spaces. And rather than just going small with microscopes, the only thing, that's why I showed, you know, Maxwell's uh, constancy of the speed of light equation. There are only things, certain things that I can take to any scale in the universe, right? And they operate no matter how small I go and how big I go. And so trying to develop these very simple ways so one might think of the project at Documento where a dancer is simply, you know, just interacting with a machine that measures them. It's so sensitive that it can hear their heartbeat, their blood moving through their veins, uh, the liquid on their eyes as they blink, right? But they're really dancing on a new horizon that's almost unimaginable, right? Their bodies, uh, their eyes can hear, their ears can see, their bodies are teleported not in a fictional way. I mean, I could go into a lab and we can measure it quantitatively. That was really important for me to know that they actually were right in these places, that we could measure the spin rate, the velocity, the Doppler shift on the particles, that this was like absolute confirmation that it wasn't, it was poetic, but it was also profoundly, you know, <laughs> quantitative. So we were really, really there. 
uh, and that someone could go in and alter the architecture of a snowflake to become something that it had never been, that in nature it couldn't occur, uh, and but not in a, in a destructive way, right? Like almost like the caves of Altamira, like leaving behind marks in places that were both small and big and saying, you know, we are billionaire creatures. We are really sort of woven into all of this and trying to build the vocabulary, the syntax and the tools to reach in there. Uh, not to, you know, pee in, in some corner and say, I've been here. It was more like communion, right? With, with God or with the universe or with, you know, all of us as a greater um, sensibility. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, well, it's like, a, it's almost like you're, are you working to dissolve the boundary between imagination and reality? Well, when I started, I basically said every time I was building these elaborate systems, whenever anybody got there, especially like the, you know, um, uh, Altamira, I, the fact that the body already recognized it, everyone always felt like they had already been, it was like deja vu. It was like you yeah. already knew it, right? It was not like it was a new thing. And that was one of the, that's one of the profound sort of realizations is it was not that new, uh, it was that it was profoundly familiar, like uncanny familiar, like, you know, your grandmother's voice off in the distance. It just had that, that sense to it. Yeah, you used uncanny earlier and I was, I was struck by that. And I'm thinking about, you know, spooky action at a distance and that idea of entanglement, right? And um, yeah. Yeah. Um, we have so little time, but um, so maybe, maybe, and this could, you could speak to this in the context of, of, of a pro one prior project or just ongoingly, yeah. but what, what impacts or benefits are you seeing unfold from any of these projects sort of carrying forward? Well, I think the key thing for me was just removing a single letter from always trying to be there Right, right to being here and it sounds like a meditative practice and COVID did a lot of things to us right um and you know i i it would sound preposterous you know if i was in a a, a state assembly meeting meeting and i said you know i spent two years removing one letter but you have to understand <laughs> right you know in an equation right you think of like a single you know uh, number being changed and all of a sudden everything completely changes um I'm uh, working on um, a project uh, that's built off of my uh, 2000 um, World Expo project called Epicycle, which was uh, live video uplinks from all of Earth's time zones. So you stood telepresent at every point in time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I am like working actively on uh, tele, uh, basically teleportation uh, and being telepresent at every single place in time. And so um, the Greeks created these elaborate mathematical structures, right? Epicycles and deference and things like that to maintain the homocentric, um, you know, earth-centric uh, worldview rather than um, the heliocentric world, which was Copernicus and Galileo. Um, and so this idea that you could stand and you would need no language barrier, right? The technology, nothing. You would just stare out a horizon, a common horizon that would be, you know, every single point on the, you know, the surface of earth uh, and you would, you know, recognize that, you know, quite easily. Um, and so those kinds of, um, you know, those are the kinds of, uh, I'll just say research, you know, projects that uh, are sort of evolving from this and the net benefit was really the letter change of one letter. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Well, I, I, I wish we could keep going. These these are just tiny glimpses. Um, these sessions. Oh, I'm sorry, I spent so much time uh, sort of at the beginning, sort of reflecting on Susanna's work and things like that. I know we've just got a tiny, a little slot. I hope everybody out there uh, enjoyed it. There's lots going on, lots yeah. of students involved, um, having just a blast uh, with uh, students in engineering and other places, and uh, and really developing really research relationships all across campus. Um, one thought that I'll leave you with is that um, when we fly to Mars, the pilots actually, after a few weeks in space, their cerebral spinal fluid actually lifts up because there's no gravity and presses on the back of their eyes and their eyes uh, change shape. And then they basically become myopic, meaning they can't see other than just a few inches away. And so the Magniforma project, even though it's highly abstract, it gives an opportunity to actually see and visualize the world in a way so totally different 
that they can navigate by dead reckoning, but through this radically different system. So, you know, we're already talking to the medical school, uh, even though it's an artwork. Uh, so yeah, lots going on. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sean. It's really great to talk with you. I look forward yes, to the pleasure. Next. Welcome everyone. If you're just joining us, um, my name is Lee Marshall and I'm director of research for School of the Arts at BCU. And I am really excited to welcome for our next round of discussion, Stephen Vitiello from our um, chair and professor in kinetic imaging here at BCU. And I think that um, I'm going to hand the reins over to you, Stephen, um, for your presentation. I'm so glad to see you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Happy to be here. Okay. So hi, everybody. I have a bit of a slideshow, sort of a miniature recap of my arts um, faculty, VC arts faculty research talk from 2020 which seems like forever ago. Um, you know, for the longest time, I would always say I'm a sound artist and I teach at VCU lately. I'm worried that that's, I've started to reverse that, but it's an important part for me of identity that I think even that I've been here since 2004 um, as, as faculty and, and the grad director and as chair, I still think of myself as an artist first and foremost and as an artist i think first and foremost about sound about listening encounters with space but always through through the body and through the ear uh, this slide is i was thinking about sean's slides are so beautiful and fancy and well produced mine are pretty pretty lo-fi but this is one that gives me great pleasure. This is from 2002 in Marfa, Texas. And I had an installation in an old space of Donald Judd's. And I remember being just terrified that no one would come, no one would listen. I went out, I came back and saw a photograph that these cowboys who never came into the art spaces there came in, lay down, some went to sleep and we're listening to this very quiet sound piece that I had made with game calls of coyotes and, and um, or coyote calls, what were they? Oh, there was like a squeal type varmint. There was an injured woodpecker. Anyway, they were treated and they were, they were to call coyotes. Um, anyway, I have lots of beginnings to my career. I started, I grew up in New York started playing in punk rock bands late 1970s, so a very long time ago, and then moved to making soundtracks for visual artists around the late 1980s. And then in the late 1990s, started to get invited to do projects of my own. And one of the first things where I was functioning as my own person, was when I was invited to participate in the World Views residency in the World Trade Center. We were given spaces in unused rooms, un unused offices, and ultimately had six months to use that as a 24 hour a day studio if we wanted. We just couldn't sleep there and produce a work at the end. And I wanted to integrate the sound of New York figured I would open windows before I knew you couldn't open the windows. But my whole practice in that six months changed. For one thing, I found out not being able to open the windows was totally confusing, but ultimately revealed a whole world through listening through surface vibration, finding contact microphones that could hear through the glass out to the city, but they could also hear the building, the building as a kind of body moving, creaking, cracking, swaying in the winds at times, uh, a very physical structure. And it changed how I felt being in the space, both emotionally, but also visually. What you saw once you could hear was a very, very different encounter. Um, 
and I'll come back to those those contact mics in a few pieces. So this is a view. I moved around offices a few times as the spaces I was in became rented, and then they would move us. Um, I was with a couple other artists, and then part of a larger group. This. Um, I think this is facing north, but a lot of the time I was facing west. But I'll play just a little, little, little bit of a recording done the morning after Hurricane Floyd peaked. And it was the loudest and most present recording I made um, during those six months. I'm going fast. I hope that came through though. Uh, through the residency, the Worldviews residency and the open studio presenting that work, I started to get invited to show in galleries. I was in Greater New York at PS1, which was a kind of career building um, exhibition for a lot of artists. And then led to showing at a gallery called The Project, which at the time was in Harlem and an incredible roster of artists, including Julie Meritu, Paul Pfeiffer, Kim Suja, uh, Maria Elena Gonzalez, just incredible people. But this was the very first sound sculpture I ever made. And it was a real butterfly, although preserved, sitting on a telephone, listening to moth wings recorded in upstate New York. And again, just a glimpse of sound. Depending on how you're listening, if you're listening on your phone or with computer speakers, a lot of the low frequencies may not have come through. But the sound of moths, the sound of hummingbirds, the sound of nature is something that started to open up to me around that time. Um, and field recording just it, it changed my whole experience of of living. And and at that point, I was such a diehard New Yorker. And don't I'd never paid attention to sound in such a way. I'd always been interested in bands and the kind of texture of songs, but field recording changed things a great deal. These are just quickly a couple other sound sculptures. Uh, this is a piece that I made at Sculpture Center in Long Island City. And while I was installing this, I was in a taxi going out there when I got the call from VCU to see if I would want to take a job at VCU and move to Richmond. And um, I thought, I guess so. I guess I'll go and see if it works out. And, you know, here we are 19 years later. Anyway, this was a, um, these were suspended speakers playing very, very, very low frequency sounds below the threshold of hearing, but the sounds would move the speakers but just you know, starting with that telephone piece, I was exploring ways to make work that was also visual, but ideally always bringing people back to the idea that it wasn't the visual first, it was the sound that was first. Um, this was a collaborative version with Julie Meritu, one of the greatest painters, I think, alive. Um, we did this in Sydney, Australia, and there was sound, there was image, and there was, ways that we influenced each other over the building process of the work. Check time. Work that was up on the High Line in New York for almost a year called A Bell for Every Minute. I think for the longest time I was the guy who did the World Trade Center piece. And then there was a point where I think for a while I was the guy who did the piece on the High Line. <laughs> which is nice because you know, no matter how much we work, I guess we're lucky when we have a signature piece. And um, 
going back to the World Trade Center, the very first sound that I ever heard when those when I found the contact mics and figured out a system was church bells. And then some years later, before the High Line opened, I was brought up there and asked, you know, if you could do a piece up here, what would you do? And I was looking at the Hudson River and I suddenly remembered the bells and thought, well, perhaps I could do a piece that maps the city through bells, bells of various cultures and produce something that would be accessible, hopefully on different levels. So not just to a, a kind of rarefied sound art ready audience, but one that might connect to people who have no interest in, let's say the experimental sound side of what I do, but to which bells might be meaningful. So I recorded, this is actually the High Line and many people probably have been up there now. This is before it looked like it looks now. This was before the plants and the landscaping and all of the beautiful design, but it was just a raw space. Um, so with that plan, I just started gathering lists of bells and getting permission to record all over the city. Um, this particular one is in the United Nations. Um, this one's City Hall, New York Stock Exchange. And this is a bell, it's just across from where the World Trade Center fell. It's a chapel and I was invited to go and re record there uh, this wonderful nun whose name was Sister Precious, still is, I'm sure, uh, rang the bell for me. She didn't speak anything except to say, come out with her. It was raining and I'll just play a little bit of it. <laughs> As you imagine, there's so many more stories and details, but I can always, you, you can all find me here at VCU, so I'm happy to tell you more anytime. Um, ultimately, the first version of it, which was on the High Line, uh, was presented here in this pedestrian tunnel. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but there was an aluminum engraved sound map on the wall that told you at any point within the hour, what you were hearing and where it was recorded. Speakers were up high. And at the beginning of the hour, all of the bells would ring together. So from a little bell on a cat's collar to a Buddhist temple to the New York Stock Exchange, uh, it might be allowed, but this is how the hour began. I'm going to zip through, well, maybe two more projects, and then and then hopefully Lee and I can speak some. Uh, in 2015, I began a new collaboration. I collaborate a great deal uh, with so many different kinds of people, artists, novelists, poets, musicians. Um, and, and since 2015, a biologist, I had been invited to Mountain Lake Biological Station, which is a facility run by uh, UVA, University of Virginia. And I was a featured visiting artist and I gave a talk one evening about my work and started with the World Trade Center and talked about listening through surfaces. And two days later, I went to a talk by their featured emerging biologist, Dr. Casey Fowler Finn. And she talked about listening through surface vibration to insects. 
and it was kind of, you know, like an electric shock of excitement and interest. And we shared notes and soon after I was invited to do a commission at Virginia Tech in the cube, which is this incredible 144 channel sound and image space. And I asked if, if the funding might be used so that I would work with Casey, which has led to many, many projects. It's hard, I don't know if you can tell, but in this there's a, a microphone on a stem and there's a daddy long leg uh, approaching. Mostly for Casey's research, she's interested in tree hoppers and oak hoppers, which make a kind of sound that is unearthly to me. Uh, we also used a laser, a very expensive laser. Here's two of her grad students focusing a laser on, on a leaf, and we we're listening to spiders walking. Here's some of the tree hoppers. And just to hear, uh, and over on the left is, this is my understanding, is a mama tree hopper. And then on the right are the, the kind of teenage uh, tree hoppers. And there's call calls that are being put out alert calls, mating calls, feeding calls. And I think if I click next, you'll hear a little bit of it. It takes a moment to get to the sound, but if anybody wants me to send them some links, just reach out to me. Okay, last project real quick. Uh, this is something I worked on for eight years. It's on the waterfront in Seattle. It's a, a it's meant to be permanent. I kind of think it's gonna be there until they can't fix it anymore. But it's a commission that is five instruments that are played by the rise and fall energy of Elliott Bay. There was different plans that we went through, um, different renderings. And here's a short video, and then maybe Lee and I can speak a bit. So I, I thought to play some of the more, more musical pieces, but again, I'm always happy to share links. Um, I always think about the elevator pitch and how problematic it is because you have to focus. And um, I've done a lot. I've been really fortunate and ideally I'll keep doing doing a lot. Yeah. Okay. So what a pleasure, Stephen, to, to do this very quick dive into your work. Thank you so much. Um, I'm thinking just because I in, just carrying forward from the mm -hmm. conversation with Sean, this idea of the intimate is so present in sat in sound work, like the way that the, that sense, the sense of the the sense of sound as a as an extremely intimate intersection with the world for us mm -hmm. um, is really present in your work, and I I really appreciate that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, yeah okay well <laughs> so maybe um i you know the world trade center piece as your signature work um maybe would you would you speak a little bit about 
what you carry forward from that work or how that work kind of, I mean, I think it was a little present in your presentation, but how that work continues to inflect your research ongoingly or what, what you really carry with you from that piece in particular? I think it was mainly, I mean, from that experience, part of it was it gave me confidence to become my own person, my own artist. And for 10 years up until then, I had done soundtracks for Tony Alisler, for Jem Cohen, for um, White Oak Dance Project, um, like all these different projects where I had learned through other people's process and and tried to find my own process within the, the gaps and and somewhat mirror them or reflect what I was experiencing. And when I started to do site-specific installations, I think part of what I realized was it was also a kind of encounter that similar to being presented with another person's vision, I was being presented with an opportunity or a location and a space and that I had to become, I had to pay attention to it and pay attention to myself in that moment. And you know, it's in, like a lot of the most installation commissions that I get, a really important part is the site visit. And sometimes it means flying to some, you know, to, to Munich or Cologne and, and walking into a place for 10 minutes going, ah, I got the idea. <laughs> And um, and I had to you know to be there and feel it. And so part of that experience of being in the World Trade Center was kind of finding myself. And it was finding the power of sound to change one's perception of space. Okay. Uh, and that intimacy is, you know, I'm also aware that each one of us are hearing differently, each one of us are experiencing something differently. But I do know that a lot of people would come into my studio in the World Trade Center who are afraid of heights on the 91st floor and go, oh no, oh no, no. And it didn't, but then it didn't feel real. But when you heard the sound, it also felt real. And you were part of, for be better and worse, the vulnerability of being in that space of a very physical space. But being, need, being able to hear opened up a lot and for some people it opened up how they saw yeah yeah this interesting I mean so when I when you played the the World Trade Center I thought because I wrote a, a poem about this in 2001 um that those buildings have an I read somewhere that they had a nine foot sway mm -hmm. and so I was like oh you that's the sound that I I, I suddenly to hear yeah physics of a, of a tall building in wind um is this embodiment, you know, we, and and the the sort of way in which the fragility of the structure is revealed um, mm -hmm. quite potently? Yeah, I remember, and I think this is from Robert Ashley, a composer. But somebody in a documentary I was listening to also said that originally that the buildings had been planned to be parallel, like side by side, and then they realized that it would have caused a massive tuning fork. And so then they were moved a little forward back. But I've I've done pieces also related to Aeolian harps, these instruments that are played by the wind. And I even did an accidental score for a, a dancer choreographer once in New York that was where the guitar was playing by wind, but my guitar was supposed to be muted while I was off stage for the first 10 minutes. And then actually it was this gorgeous, like choir of singing that was the wind playing the strings of my guitar. Yeah, this this way. So you talked about, um, you know, that field recording kind of opened up the world for mm -hmm. you in a, in a new way or that, or, and I'm thinking about sound as this physical, like we can, we can, we can assume a sense of distance from when seeing, right? Mm -hmm. That we're here and something is over there and we're seeing it, but sound enters our, body and um not just through the tissue but like through our bones yeah yeah um, and so it the experience of sound renders us really one with our environment um yeah and and for people who don't hear so in the in the traditional way right there is still that that feeling of vibration yeah as the primary yeah 
I was just watching a documentary about Pauline Oliveros, who is one of my my men, like two great mentors, and she did a gorgeous piece that was all for people who who don't hear. And mm -hmm. um, it was a, it was a concert and just something really beautiful to think about, and hopefully for the people who participated to to experience. Yeah, I just went to a deaf opera in Charlottesville, and that was extraordinary. I bet. I bet. I bet. But that's like, okay, <laughs> hmm. um, maybe um, could you speak a little bit about um, about your research inter and intersection with teaching or with st students interacting with your hmm. research? I, think, I mean, there's been different ways. I mean, my background really wasn't academic and it was through learning from Pauline Oliveros from Nam Jean Paik from Tony Alisler, artists who gave me opportunity to work with them as a collaborator, but having to run to catch up because yeah. they had so much more experience. And um, even some years, like not so long ago, Ryuichi Sakamoto, who just passed away. And I think my attitude in teaching has been somehow similar, which is, I mean, I realize I'm in a school and I have to try to speak a certain language but mostly what i want to do with students is share my passion for here listening uh share experiences and and often when i teach a sound class on the first day i'll say this thing that nobody believes but it's is that you know we'll work with technology but technology is easy compared to ideas and paying attention and becoming attuned and I can teach them to use a software, but they could also learn that. So they get mad about this, but they could learn a software through a, a tutorial. But what I want to mostly encourage is an awareness of listening, whether it be every day, whether it be the video game that they're going to play as soon as class is over, whether it be all of the different textures that they hear as they enter, leave our building and walk down the alley. I, mean, I was so excited yesterday we had a final part one crits in, in one of my classes and one of the students pieces had you could feel the pebbles falling in their sound work mm -hmm. and then they had this momentous large kind of sound event going on where it was a headphone piece but the fact that they were giving us the tiniest detail and the biggest global sound made me just you know overjoyed because I felt like they had gotten it yeah. and I and I knew that they were exploring a level of detail that they didn't at the beginning of the semester so but that was for me more about my playing them works by different work artists mm -hmm. calling attention to scenes you know a scene in the Incredibles like something far more commercial than the way we're working but that had a, a pin dropping you know yeah yeah so where um where is your curiosity taking you now? Like what what directions are you pursuing? Been working on some albums. I've been working with um, different musicians. Brendan Canty, who is a drummer from the band Fugazi, uh, my friend Taylor Dupree, and and I, I'm hoping I just got asked to do two site specific performances in New York in this incredible archway in the fall. I'm going to be at Mountain Lake Biological Station again doing re, um, sound recordings this summer. And not necessarily, I mean, when I've done it before, I've always done it with Casey, who's a scientist, and she's partially interested in data. But I'm going to go there and use the methods I've learned from her just for my own passion of finding what's what's sounding, you know, in the trees. Yeah. How does this change as you just walk around outside? Like, how do you feel changed by this work? I, think I, change, I mean, part of it is I have to turn on. I mean, it's because if I was always that carefully listening, I'd be walking into light poles all the time, yeah, right. you know. Um, it's, but I think it just it's just always giving me a, a sense of, of how many different ways we can experience life. Uh, something that might be really beautiful going on broad street which i don't tend to think of as broad, as beautiful uh, or sitting in the courtyard in this building and listening to broad street and marshall street two very different worlds uh, kind of harmonizing 
sometimes dissonantly, sometimes very, uh, very beautifully. Yeah. Okay, that's fantastic. And I'm, I really, I've, I'm thinking a lot about, there's a lot of, I think, in our, in our immediately current discourse, there's a lot more um, or increasing understanding of, of an, like an animist relationship with the world around us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Your work is, a, is like a, gives a sort of technological entry point into this, this, this deepening of a, of a relationship with of ourselves with everything you know, yeah everything. and there's technologies that will amplify it but you can also do it by just closing your eyes and you Attention, know. right yeah 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 well i wish we had the rest of today um mm -hmm. thank you. but thank you <laughs> thank you so much Stephen. it's such a pleasure to talk with you yeah, yeah. i appreciate the invitation and time. absolutely i hope we can do okay. it again. best of luck through the rest of the semester oh yeah yeah, I'll see you soon. All right, thanks, Lee. Thanks. Bye. All right, friends, if you're just joining, I am um, glad to welcome you to Research Rewind. My name is Lee Marshall. I am the Director of Research for the School of the Arts um, at BCU, and we're bringing in our last panelist of today, um, Magdalena Adamek, and I'm going to highlight... Magda, once she comes on screen. Come yes. on. Hello. Okay. Let's see. Hi. So good to see you. Thank you for good being to see with you us. As well. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And just to say, um, you are a professor, uh, assistant professor in the music department. My lecture was in November um, last year. So um, the title of the presentation was uh, Frédéric Chopin, his music and quest for autist, uh, artistic authenticity. Um, I, in this lecture, I'll explored the composer who is, of course, very well known to the uh, audiences around the globe. Um, but I, my angle was to um, aim a little bit further to present him not only as a composer of great pieces for piano, who's the need to be played and they are very uh, played by students by professional pianists all over the world uh, i wanted to present him as a fascinating figure a persona who was a um, very successful teacher entrepreneur um and also um a musician a pianist it's like he, he was pretty much everything i think despite living the the 19th uh, in the 19th century he had all the qualities that we would be looking for uh, today in any in any artist so he he still remains phenomenon um I've, sometimes I've, I've been go i'm going to different uh, platforms or website about chopin and everyone is in awe to this day about his, his quality and he he still remains one of the most transformative uh, and iconic artists of all time, mainly because, uh, and this is what fascinates me the most, is that he um, he remained true to himself throughout his life, and he had this innate ability to combine his own heritage. He was Polish, half Polish, half French, French because of his father and Polish from his mother, um, which also, also is very close to home because I come from Poland as well, so. <laughs> Um, uh, this, so he was able to bridge his heritage and Western forms uh, in which he was using for as, as composition in in very successful way. And what's even more interesting is that when he was nineteen, he became an expat. He had to leave Poland because you see that's what I sh what I showed in my slide. Uh, that he um, Poland didn't exist at that time. So. Um, you know, there was a land grab. Uh, I, in my lecture, I gave really uh, much more insight into how the so-called land grab, as I call it, happened uh, three times uh, with the Austria, Austrian Empire, the Prussia, Prussia, uh, Russian Empire uh, intervened and took uh, Poland apart. So. Um, you know, part of what where he also left was, of course, a fear for his safety, and his family was very concerned for him. But 
a big part of it was that he felt i would i'm gonna say a little bit suffocated he wanted to at his age to explore the world and he knew he had a huge talent and he just wanted to go to go out and just find more opportunities so um the focus of my lecture was um how how life how life of chopin shaped and how um what the cu cultural and uh, political climate was like at that time uh and how it shaped his artistic stance because it definitely changed it definitely progressed to his life and it really contributed to um to the creation of those masterpieces that we are listening to today um and they are they are cherished so one of my slides was here uh, he was born this is uh, the actual the the uh, manor house the the place when he was born it's uh, Jelaz, it's called Jelazova Vola it's hop, it's his birthplace it's uh, not that far from the capital of Poland Warsaw right now there is a very beautiful um salon there when uh, artists get invited from all, get invited from all over the world to play and people actually uh, congregate outside that little house when he used to live as a, as a child and they listen to the music uh, in the garden it's a very special place that i happened to visit and also i also played there it's it's an undescribable feeling you just feel that amazing connection and you people just come there for him it's like you know they go it's like a mecca for musicians and audiences people who want to explore um the soul of what made chopin chopin um uh as i said i'm not going to play uh, audio because we we would we would have to go really uh go very much further into that but i wanted to also show you um the play that's one of the slides that i showed was uh this is another place in poland called Szafarnia, as that is pronounced in polish as, as sh it's uh, where Chopin used to spend his teenage years and he actually uh, he was visiting nearby villages uh, exploring actually the folk culture and that Polish folk culture, the language, the, the folk music that was being played at weddings and all different parties <laughs> explored. He, uh, it very much influenced his, his style when he actually created a like a dance uh, stylization of a dance um, dance form for the piano that was called mazurka and he uh, listened and he he actually even played explored different instruments as far as i recall he he um, as a pianist he was very eager to pick up something that looked like, like a double bass this was just like a folk, folk version so um so definitely, um, he um, he progressed from someone who had very, I would say, very happy childhood to someone who ha had ha actually had to ha uh, say goodbye, and he left for Europe, um, uh, Western Europe. He traveled a little bit. Um, he went to Vienna. He went to Dresden, and he presented concerts. But eventually, he settled in Paris. And that was, you know, year 1830 when, and that was exactly the time when the revolution against Russians broke out and there was no way for him to return. He had to stay and that's when he remained for the end of his life. Um, I wanted to um, show you Oh, yes, I wanted to also, uh, this is what he looked like. Uh, towards the end of his life when he he i don't know how many people know that he, um you know there are, there are unofficial theories that he died from something else than tuberculosis but definitely it was a lung disease um combined with exhaustion he was only 39 so this is actually one of his true uh, photos and this daguerreotype taken it uh, two two years before his death and the authors louis auguste pisson um and um, this this photo has been distributed all over the world as one of his really true um, photographs. It shows him being really 
worn down because by the end of the um by the end of his life uh you know not only just being away but also the the illness taking toll on his body and also uh, certain traits of his personality he was definitely neurotic in many ways a perfectionist he towards the end of his life he actually doubted very much his his style um and whether he was uh, true to himself and he definitely when you listen to his music early music is very much influenced by brilliance by um, lots of virtuos virtuosity lots of very complex passages as it as it evolves over time it becomes a little bit more bare there's a lot of much more looking into the past and he for example he really loved Bach so I think his music uh, tends to be much more austere and at the same time, in terms of language, very adventurous. And um, he may not know at that time he, he was looking pretty much what was going to happen in music in the 20th and the 20th, 21st century. That's what makes him, I think, very special um, because um, he didn't know that at that time, but he, he felt it very deeply. So I think some one of the comments that I got after the lecture was, well, that his face at this photo was showing that, um, that kind of sense of resignation and um, uncertainty, what was going to happen to, to art going further. Uh, that was one of the interesting comments. And another great comments I got about this, and this is actually a, uh, this is his Chopin's um, left hand, um, and it looks, he had very beautiful hands, um, beautiful hand position that he always, for the piano players, he always advocated to be as natural as possible. He went pretty much against the, all the old school of piano playing that we would hear of, that we have to keep hand fingers really curved together. He he completely revolutionized uh, also piano technique. So in many aspects, he was fascinated. So that's how I was, I was trying to highlight not only some pieces, but mainly his um, how he lived and how his departure from the country he actually admired and who, which didn't exist um, became ingrained in his brain as, as a memory at the same time how he tried to preserve that culture and fought very hard to keep it in his music not politically so that's pretty much it to answer your question i know it was a long answer <laughs> that was beautiful thank you so much for for the recap and um i'm i'm really i'm so interested to to talk with you so just thinking about like mm -hmm. your own um, your own practice as a musician and yeah. what it is to play someone else's music, right? Mm -hmm. To play the music of a composer that you um, that you admire, um, whose work is monumental in in the canon, right. and and the way in which that that music carries, you know, the the life and work that you that you've. Yeah you've investigated and revealed. So I'm going to start with being extremely simplistic and uh, <laughs> and I'm going to also start with the statement that I heard and I need I need to answer to that because I, I heard many times that oh performers if you are a performer you are not necessarily a researcher mm -hmm. um, which is I completely disagree with because yes. um, well this presentation for example was was an example of how I not only open the book and try to decode, and I'm going to use the word decode, black dots and all those symbols on page into something that makes sounds. That it's in itself, is, it's an amazing process to begin with. But I've been always, um, I, I think this presentation is an example how it's important to carry a deep investigation of the pieces that you play, because it's going to inform, automatically inform my engagement with people who listen and students' engagement and anyone who, who actually experienced this music. So, um, of course, the composer I presented about had spe special significance to me. I was born in the same country and I played his music since I was a child, so I feel that, that connection. Um, but at the same time, uh, this is a this this world that I'm carrying is a continuation of the path that I chose a long time ago, and I promised myself that I'm never 
you know, I carry this, this motto from my own home when my parents told me that never forget who you are mm. and where you come from. So th this, the sense of this place, the geographic and cultural displacement that, for example, Chopin felt, I felt, I feel very deeply. And uh, people who are, become expats, who leave the country, they, it's, it's very, it's many ways psychological. We do feel that we are, you don't really know where your home is. You know, you know where, you, where your heart belongs, but at the same time, it's very hard to put both feet on the ground because you assimilate the culture you are currently existing in, and then you have memories from the past. So that's, that's also helped me to gain more insight keeps help, uh, helping get my insight into the music. Um, basically, I come, but when it comes to other composers, and I actually love to explore uh, music from my country and particularly music from, this, from Central Europe of composers who are lesser known. And that's always been my, uh, my personal choice and something uh, people appreciate it because I always tend to include a lesser known work in my recital. How many times can we listen to the same piece over and over? Well, probably a long time, but I think people need always something fresh and there's a lot of great stuff there. So I come from a standpoint that I want to feel close to what I'm doing and I'm sure people want to feel closer to art and they seek, the, they seek that connection. And music, oh yes, we heard that before. Music is a universal language. We know that, that saying, it connects people across the globe, blah, blah, blah. But the most important thing is that um, without, for me at least, without certain context, for example, how this person lived, what, um, what other sources are saying, without taking that deep dive into that historical slash cultural context, it's, I think it's going to be hard for me as a person who is decoding music <laughs> uh, to um to translate it for people because they will all without any sort of uh, any sort of background they will also have hard time to relate to it so i think what I, what i what i carry forward is that i'm going to continue on the path of really um studying studying uh, not only music itself but for example the meaning of uh, how performance practice whether if it's a composer from the past yes i'm gonna look into performance practices i'm going to look into historical background i'm going to look what was going on in general art trends at that time because it always makes sense it always comes together so this is how it how it informs me and this is this is what i do and when it comes to the composers who are lesser known what i tend to do is i of course i feel a little bit freer because there's no that predefined platform that people have already spoken written so i feel like it's i have a little bit more freedom to be that first person and i did that uh, uh, in the past, that was paused um, after finishing my doctor. There was this uh, composer who lived in the first half of the 20th century, a Polish composer, whose last name no one could ever pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know if I can put it in the chat or not. Uh, yeah. Is yes. it available? But okay, right now it's okay. I'm just going to just put it in the chat. Um, the long name. Polish last names are very long sometimes. <laughs> okay, so Felix, Felix, you can say it, Felix uh, Nowowiejski. So this is a composer who I um, I researched extensively, and actually I did the world premiere recording of his piano solo pieces that led me into writing a book about his solo pieces uh, that also led me to many lecture recitals and different projects so that was completely different platform because i had access to actually living family his family wow. his descendants were still alive so i was interviewing them i was looking at those amazing manuscripts uh, that handwritten lots of stuff was unpublished at that time and i was extremely lucky and i felt oh so now it's my chance to actually to show how I can understand it without any things to be preconceived. Mm -hmm. So there, I, I, I'm, to answer your question, there are two, two facets to that. It depends who I'm dealing with. But also when it comes to um, 
of course, when it comes to music, I'm playing today. For example, I have my uh, I have the advanced coaching class, uh, which in which I I admit students by audition, and they ex they choose one piece to work with me di directly. So that cultural investigation I carry through with to my students, and I ask them to take that deep dive. They actually have that fill up those templates and answer many questions. Well, when was the piece written? what kind of stylistic features do you find if it's a modern music well we talk about different um sounds uh different uh characters that could be built through the process of active thinking so it's not only about that about that repro reproduction like many people think the performance only reproduce yeah. i think there's a lot about creating so that's also part of the how do you research how do you decode music like on page and also in the context it was composed to to make it like a product and to make it like a very convincing story a product yeah. to deliver to 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 the audience mm -hmm. i'm so curious about so if you were to play a piece before you do this investigate right you play you see you you yeah. play the piece and then you look, you do this learning and this investigation about, and then play the piece again. I, I don't know if you can sort of speak to like mm -hmm. what that evolution might be like for, for the performer. So if it's a, if it's already a prepared piece, uh, it's never the same. Right. Uh, if, at least for me, I, it's, it's, it's something, there's something intangible about, um, about art itself that you when you are actually performing music that you research so deeply when you study it deeply oh that's how long i should hold that note that's how long my path should be should i take off the pedal exactly in that spot a little bit later uh it's never the same so the second time when i look at it i i actually realize oh my gosh that's going to be so completely something new now because i can make additional decisions um, with how I am going to uh, to produce sound and I, it, it it can relate to tempo. It can relate to how I use you know how I build. I I call it musical sentences, phrases. It, it has to do with balancing. So I think um, I really think that a good artist is not repetitive. I know I'm gonna raise that statement. And also it's like I always tell my student, look, look, he's repeating this melody all over the like five times in a row. Why do you think this composer did this? And they go, Oh, I don't know. Well, maybe to just confirm the key we are playing. I mean, I think it well, or maybe he he or she or they, they are giving you opportunity to do for you to to do something with it whether it's a special timing, whether it's a, a specific articulation. If it's repeated, it must have a purpose in that for you to, to, to be creative. So it's, it's always, it's never, I always come through this time, but it should never be the same. It should always get people on the edge of the seats and, um, and it should always be spontaneous. And Chopin was like that. Uh, yeah. He was a fantastic improviser on the piano he was admired he, he never felt like he was this uh persona who could get in front of many many people because i from what i got he had terrible stage anxiety and he he was neurotic as i said but he could improvise just well and lots of those beautiful flourishes that we hear in this music come from the fact that he was always creating and that's what really fascinates me yeah, I love the idea of repetition as a gift to the performer yes. so that you get a chance to revisit and, and elaborate and, and and evolve your relationship with the phrase. Um, that's an amazing way to think about it. Um, how about like thinking about your students, you know, you so it sounds like, you know, you take your students through a similar process of investigation of, of a, you know, the person who's who's created the, the work that they're going to play. Um, can you talk about like what you've seen in your students' evolution as performers when they engage in that process? Oh, yes. Yeah. So um, I, I don't think we have that much time from what I said, but I can tell you that I've seen those students who are really attuned to the process, I've seen an amazing transformation. And that's something that stays with them with after they graduate. So. Uh, 
I was actually surprised when I came here, and I didn't come here a long time ago. It was, I think it's been seven years. Um, that culture didn't exist of that engagement of understanding. It's like, you know, I, it's like looking at the can and canvas at a piece of art on the wall. What do you make of it? They never thought of it this way. They just thought, oh, I'm going to just play this piece. I'm going to just learn the notes and I'm going to play. And I say, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, it's way harder. It is exhausting, but those of them who actually learned to appreciate the process it really informed they how they played because so many details were worked through and they made sense to them and when it's something makes sense to the performer it's actually much easier to come across to people because you know um uh, the, the audience knows where, where someone is coming from so so definitely i think uh it's something def definitely needed first of all as a musician, whether you write a thesis, whether you write a book or whether you write a blog, everything needs to come from the standpoint that someone has built in that vocabulary of historical perspective, of awareness of what's going on around, awareness of culture. The, the culture of detachment is pretty painful that I'm seeing around. And I think by forcing people, forcing, and I'm going to use the word forcing because that's <laughs> <laughs> by forcing people to actually engage actively and thinking about what we're doing, that makes the experience much more meaningful. And music should be meaningful. Yes. It cannot be just something you just, just go pass by, pass by and, um, and especially when it comes to the, the, the Chopin, or when everyone wants to play it. And I was asked, well, what do you know? What do you know about him? Yeah. What pieces have you? I want to play this big pole on us. Oh, no, <laughs> that's <laughs> going to start. You're going to go online. You're going to grab this book. First, you have to learn. Yeah. With my sense. Yeah. That importance of context that a piece is not divorced from its culture and from its from its origins. And the more you know about it, the richer your interaction can be. I think we have time for just one more. I just want to ask, you, like, what where your curiosity is taking you now in, mm -hmm. in your research yes so uh my curiosity remains constant <laughs> <laughs> so uh i this this year particularly i've done a couple of projects that stemmed uh from that lecture that i did that in, lecture inspired me to do further so i'm going to mention um a couple of things i did this video project and i do have a link for that would you like me to put it in chat i would like that to would be great it. yeah so the 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 link is in uh, the, this is a piano recital fe featuring exclusively polish music but not only chopin there are, there are composers who are lesser known but beautifully lesser known to western audiences i'm, I'm gonna say who wrote extremely valuable um, pieces and very beautiful to listen to. So that was done for the uh, Kościuszka Foundation. And Kościuszka Foundation is a prestigious organization um, in America, uh, in North America, is uh, specifically United States that promotes language and uh, music and Polish culture. And actually, um, part of part of uh, activity is not only uh, organizing various events, but also making exchanges with academic institutions in Poland. It has many chapters throughout the state. So I did this video project for them. Uh, and another, well, I recently uh, I I followed up with all all Chopin uh, recital of for of pieces for cello and piano um, in Boston. Uh, area uh, with one of the fabulous, one of the best cellists, uh, Emmanuel Feldman, who actually happens to live in Boston area and who is also happens to be an, an inventor. That's for another topic. Uh, and we we actually did uh, Chopin's uh, arrangements for piano pieces for cello and piano. So that was new for the audience. Also, we did one of his lesser played pieces, a duo, and also his sonata. I also did a lecture recital at Richmond Public Library on uh, Central European music, showing um, contemporary Polish composers such as um, uh, Gurecki, 
uh, and also featuring Bela Bartok, a Hungarian composer. So I'm, I'm continuing. So my curiosity is still taking me on. I'm, I'm sort of thinking of staying on the same path, but always adding something new. Um, and uh, just trying to just live by inspiration that uh, heritage matters. And I think it's very important to share it with people. And yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Magdalena. What a treat to to get to speak with you about this. I really, Thank you. yeah, I so appreciate your time. And um, I wish you the best as you continue. Thank and, you very much. Um, for endless curiosity. Thank you very much for having me again. Absolutely. All right. Take care. Thank we'll you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks everyone for joining us. This concludes part one of Research Rewind for VCU Arts, and we'll be back tomorrow at noon for five more speakers. We'll see you then.